It's that time in Spain where we're joined by Brett Hansen from Brevins Franks. How are you doing, Brett? Hello, Howard. Well, um, I have a terrible cold, but uh, thankfully this can't be spread via radio. How are you? Well, thank you very much. I'm glad that we're at a distance today. Well, we have an interesting topic to discuss, socially responsible investing. Brett, this year's COP27 meeting in Egypt has just come to an end. The discussions covered various important issues for our future and what the governments and companies can do. Of course, there are small things we can do on individual too, and there are some references to ESG investing. So what is ESG investing? Uh, yes, Howard. COP27, and the COP stands for Conference of the Parties, has come to an end and was a global United Nations summit about climate change and how countries can bring it under control. And so heads of state and other dignitaries flew into Egypt from around the world, increasing the world's carbon footprint in order to talk about uh, a number of climate issues, including how to reduce the world's carbon footprint. But putting aside this summit, there's no doubt that certainly over recent months, whilst much of the news uh, has been understandably covering the ongoing horrific situation in the Ukraine, and more recently the shenanigans with the UK government, it's also been reporting on environmental issues affecting the planet and our daily lives, what with both the droughts and floods experienced across the world earlier in the year, and the recent protests. And there has also been much talk about the need to invest in alternative sources of energy, what with the significant increase we have all experienced with our energy bills. And many of these alternatives which are, are being put forward are more environmentally friendly. And I think seeing the impact that these floods and droughts are having on our environment and hearing and reading about how it will impact our children and our grandchildren's lives in the future, plus the fact we're seeing less and less money in our pocket at the end of each month, means that many of us are already thinking about uh, things that we can do, um, partly to improve uh, the environmental situation, but also financially. For example, I'm seeing more and more people in Spain install solar panels in order to help reduce their electricity bills over the longer term. And likewise, interest in ESG investment has also been growing in recent years, where investors are placing greater emphasis on the environment and the social impact of their investments, whereby the investors are wanting to make sure that the firms benefiting from their money aren't contributing to problems like climate change as well as corruption and inequality. So in answering your question, Howard, let's start with what ESG means. And ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance, which are non-financial factors which investors are using to measure an investment company's sustainability, in addition to financial returns. Environmental factors look at the conservation of the world. Social factors examine how a company treats people both inside and outside the company. And then you have governance factors, which consider how a company is run. So ESG investing is investing in these companies who take into consideration the environment and our human well-being, as well as the economy. And as I have already said, in recent years, there has been a significant expansion in ESG investing. And we're certainly being asked more and more about this type of investing from UK nationals moving to European countries we advise in. So who and what are ESG companies? Well, ESG companies are, in effect, companies who prioritise their company's impact on the environment, on its employees and customers, and on society as a whole. So companies which take seriously the impact of their activities on the environment, i.e. their carbon footprint, their greenhouse gas emissions, their renewable energy usage, then these companies which avoid or minimise environmental liabilities such as climate impact or pollution, would meet this requirement. A company's impact on its employees, its customers, its consumers, uh, suppliers and the local community, i.e. how the employees are treated, the racial diversity among staff and executives, well, companies who look after the health of their employees 
and these companies which have high morale and low turnover would also be included in ESG companies. And then when it comes to governance, companies who have good business ethics and do not, for example, have excessive executive remuneration. So in summary, ESG companies are ones which considers how a company serves its staff, its communities, its customers and the environment. So how can someone find and invest in ESG companies? Is this easy to do? These days, Howard, most public companies, as well as many private ones, are evaluated and rated uh, on their ESG performance by various third-party companies and ratings agencies. These include Bloomberg and MSCI, the latter being an American finance company headquartered uh, in New York. Institutional investors and asset managers are increasingly relying on these reports and ratings to assess and measure companies' ESG performance compared to their peers. But you don't need to spend hours researching a company's ESG track record and scores or uh, spend much time comparing its share price with other companies to try and work out which ones to invest in. Because just like with other investments, you can buy funds which invest in highly rated ESG companies. You can also always choose to use a financial advisory company that incorporates responsible investing within its existing investments, meaning that you don't have to involve yourself in much more work. And you can invest as you would normally do without compromising returns or your attitude to risk. Like I said, we're being asked more and more about this form of investing, and we are thankfully in a position to be able to offer this to our clients. Do many people already invest in ESG? And do ESG companies tend to perform well? Well, Howard, while research shows only one in five investors have made investments in ESG, there are more than twice as many investors who say they are interested in doing so. And over $500 billion flowed into ESG funds in 2021, contributing to about 55% growth in assets under management in ESG products. And this is expected to continue to grow in the coming years uh, for obvious reasons. With regards to performance, a recent study by MSCI found that companies with better environmental, social and governance scores have generally delivered higher total returns to shareholders over the past decade than those without such scores. But as with all types of investments, Howard, the returns you are likely to get back will depend largely on your attitude to risk and the length of time that you hold the investments for. And I presume the usual investment principles apply. For example, is diversification important when investing in ESG companies or funds? Exactly, Howard. Regardless of the returns, and as with anything in life, diversification is very important. But when it comes to investing, whether it's in ESG or more traditional investments, you should always follow the same important steps we have talked about in the past, namely establishing your objectives and how long you are looking to invest for, obtain an objective analysis of your attitude to risk, make sure you have a mix of assets in your portfolio which are then diversified further by, for example, sector and geographical location. And if you are considering a new investment, make sure that it fits in with the rest of your portfolio and doesn't impact your risk weighting. And finally, of course, make sure you carry out regular reviews. Before investing, how can we establish what our risk profile is? And then, how do we build an investment portfolio around it? Well, whenever someone is investing, at Blevins Franks, we are quite clear that we have to first obtain a clear and objective assessment of their appetite for risk. There are a number of ways to do this, but I find the best way to achieve the best results is for the client to carry out a psychometric assessment on risk, which also takes into consideration their other assets and also their investment objectives. It's clearly not just good enough to simply ask someone what is their attitude to risk on, say, a risk scale of 1 to 6 or 1 to 10, because what we find is, is that when markets are doing well and are near their peak, people tend to be more optimistic and very positive about stock markets and are willing to take more risk, probably at a time when people should be more concerned about the risks of their investments falling, uh, albeit in the shorter term. 
And likewise, when markets are low, then people tend to be more cautious and risk adverse. And ironically, this is when, for new investors, much of the bad news is already factored into the markets and uh, normally an opportune to invest. It's therefore important to understand how potential market fluctuations, like I just described, will affect an individual investor both emotionally and financially in order to understand their true attitude to risk. And only once we've established a client's attitude to risk and objectives can we then allocate the right amounts of the portfolio of investments to cash, bonds and, and shares. And when allocating money to each of these asset classes, the higher the concentration in a particular asset class, then the higher the risk. And so, as I said earlier, the tried and tested strategy to, to mitigate this risk is to diversify even further by not only across different asset classes, but also by investing in different geographical regions and market sectors so that you limit your exposure to any single sector of the market. And once you've established your investment portfolio, how often should you review and adjust it? Well, Howard, as our regular listeners will know, I have often spoken about the importance of regular reviews and the fact that at Blevins Franks, we employ private client managers whose sole job is to ensure that all our clients' portfolios, objectives, circumstances and tax situation are reviewed each year. Any investments or pensions which are susceptible to the performance of the markets should be reviewed in this annual meeting to see if they need to rebalance because as asset values rise and fall, the, the portfolio of investment can shift away from the original portfolio's uh, attitude to risk and profile. But regular reviews, Howard, are also vitally important to ensure that our clients have not changed and that their financial affairs remain compliant and up to date as tax rules do regularly change here in Spain at both government and at the regional level. Also, client circumstances change, whether, they, whether it's their attitude to risk or it could be, for example, that previously they didn't need an income, but now they do. So this annual review should cover not just a review of their investments and pensions, but also their situation, their attitude to risk and the tax rules and rates which will affect them at that time. Of course, if any of our listeners would like to discuss anything we have covered today with one of our qualified advisors, then they can find the contact details of their local Blevins Franks office at our website www.blevinsfranks.com. Interesting and topical. Thank you very much, Brett. We'll talk again in a fortnight. Thanks, Howard. Hopefully by then I'll be feeling better. Good luck with that.